I invite you to bow with me as I pray the 19th Psalm. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O God, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. I'd like to read the Easter story from the Gospel of Matthew. As you know, each of the four Gospels tells the story a little bit differently. But this morning I would like to focus on Matthew's version from Matthew 28, verses 1 and following. I'd invite you to stand as you are able for the reading of the Holy Gospel. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descending from heaven, came and rolled back the stone and sat upon it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him, the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Be not afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has been raised. And further he said, Come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell the other disciples, he has been raised from the dead. And indeed, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. This is my message for you. So they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell the disciples. Suddenly, as they ran, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came to him, took hold of his feet and worshipped him. And then Jesus said to them, be not afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Here ends this reading. Amen. Please be seated. I think this passage makes it evident why God sent women to the tomb that morning and not the men. The guards who were there passed out immediately, but the women were fine, it appears. They came and saw the tomb sealed up, and there was an earthquake, and the stone was rolled away. And then an angel of the Lord descended and spoke to them. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful image, it's a beautiful message. It's particularly interesting when you think about being in a tomb or being in a cave. Have you ever spent much time in a cave? It's interesting also because Jesus wasn't waiting for the stone to be rolled away before he could get out. Jesus was already raised from the dead before the stone was rolled away. The rolling away of the stone is secondary to the story. The resurrection has already taken place. Because it doesn't say the stone was rolled away and then God raised Jesus from the dead. But the angel says Jesus is already gone. Long before the stone was moved, Jesus was already raised. The good news in that is that even when we're in the dark and we can't see out of it, the miracle and the resurrection of Jesus Christ is happening in your life. The daylight, the dawn of a brand new day, is only the ability for us to see the resurrection. The resurrection has already happened. Have you ever experienced that before, where you know that there has been a miracle worked in your life, but you haven't, you haven't witnessed it yet, you haven't paid homage to it yet, but finally when you can see, when the light is turned on, you see indeed there was a miracle that took place. Sometimes it's our after sight, isn't it? Our hindsight. I don't know about you, but my hindsight is much better than my foresight. Amen? And how many times have we looked back on a period in our life that we remember as total darkness? And yet, in hindsight, we can see that the miracle, the work, the resurrection of Jesus Christ took place even in the dark. 
God's work is not bound by stone tombs. God's work is not bound by light or darkness. And here's the hard part. God's work is not even bound by our ability to bear witness to it. Because God does God's work whether we're paying any attention or not. God didn't wait to say, well, once all the disciples get here, then I'll do a miracle. God didn't wait to say, once people get their act together, then I'll do something miraculous. Thank goodness, amen. We would still be waiting. But it was in the midst of the dark, in the midst of the night, when hopelessness had overtaken the people of faith, it was at that moment that Jesus was raised from the dead and the miracle of God became reality. And then it was sometime after that that the stone was rolled away so the light could be shown into the tomb so that those of us who can't see God's work easily can finally see the resurrection is real. And I believe Easter is not just about the miracle of the resurrection. Easter is about the dawn of a brand new day when the light can shine in and we can see the miracle of God. I don't know about you, but it seems like I miss more miracles than I see. It seems like I miss more miracles than I see because I want to see it with my own eyes, like Peter, who wasn't sure and ran to the tomb afterwards, or like Thomas, who, even after he heard about it, wanted to touch the hands and the side of Jesus. Who can blame Thomas? I'm right there with him. People want to see and feel, because when miracles happen in the dark, sometimes it's hard to believe. But with the dawn of that brand new day, and the stone rolled away, light entered that tomb, and the miracle had already happened. So when um, Julie and I were dating, or courting as I prefer, <laughs> my kids are like, nobody courts. We did a lot of camping, and one of the things we did is we decided, and this seemed like a good idea. It seems like you're good, a good idea when you're in your 20s, right? Young and in love, anything sounds like a good idea. Let's go snow caving. So we're living in Colorado, and here's the crazy part. You hear, let's go snow caving, and the answer is, no thank you, right? But that wasn't our answer. We said, yes, that would be terrific. So we signed up with a guy who taught wilderness winter survival in the Arctic to the Navy. And he taught in the off season, he taught winter survival to regular people in Colorado. And I have no idea how I came across his name, but I found this guy. It seemed like a great idea. And so you have to take classes with him first to learn how to do this. There's some basic survival stuff. You need the right equipment and gear, which is great. Julie actually asked me after I finished seminary, how did you finish seminary with debt? I said, well, I spent my student loans at REI and bought gear so I could go snow caving. So the idea of snow caving is we went to Monarch Ski Resort way out in the middle of Colorado with your backpack and our snowshoes. And you ride the ski lift up. And instead of skiing back down like normal people do, you hike through the back bowls with your snowshoes and your backpack to spend three days with your friends. And so what we did is we hiked back there. And there were about, oh, there were about 12, eh, 12 or 16 of us on the trip, most of the folks we knew. And so we hiked back there. And you had to be in teams of four. I think there were 16, because there were four people per cave. And you had to dig your own cave. It's not like the hotel where you say, are there any caves available? <laughs> if you want to stay in a cave, you have to dig it yourself. And actually, sleeping in a cave in the winter is much better, because it's warmer. Now, this sounds a little crazy. Being surrounded by ice and snow is warmer than being in a tent, because a tent can drop down to about 15 or 20 degrees. But a snow cave stays in the mid-30s all night. 
And when it's 10 below out at 12,000 feet, 30s is really fairly balmy. So you get, you get to the top and then you, you get into this thing and there's all these snow drifts, these giant snow drifts that are like 15 feet tall. And then you get your team of four and you start digging with your snow shovels into the snow and there's a way to do this and he's walking around coaching everyone. It didn't seem like dude was doing much work, he was doing a lot of talking and we were doing a lot of shoveling. But we shoveled and you shovel in and then when you get in you shovel a dome so you can actually stand up in the snow cave. Okay, And so you shovel the dome and then you shovel a, a, a corridor where you can walk about 24 inches wide and then you put a shelf at about knee level where you're going to sleep. And the idea is you sleep on that shelf and then the cold air, the cold air, unlike the 30 degree air up here, the cold air drops down into that little walkway, into that little sump and takes the coldest air away from you. So you create this shelf and then two people can sleep on each side and your gear and then you put a little hole in the, um, in the front. But then you take your, as you're cutting your pathway, you take a saw and you cut out snow bricks because you need those to block the entryway, okay? So you cut out your path, these block snow blocks, and then what you first one you do, you always cut too big because you think, I can lift any snow block. So you cut a really big one and then you think, I'm going to cut a smaller snow block. So you cut the smaller snow blocks and you stand them up and you create a little bridge and a wall. So you crawl into your, into your little cave and then you can stand up once you get on the other side of the wall. And there's a little air hole to let air come in, which is very important in your cave dwelling. You can also cook in there. And so you can fire up your stove in there and you can heat water um, and you can fix your food. Now, this was good, except most of us listened to, I don't remember the guy's name. We'll call him Dude. Ray? Ray. Julie remembers Ray? I don't remember Ray. Why does she remember Ray? No, so anyway. So Ray encouraged us to bring our food in these foil bags because all you have to do is heat water and pour the water in it and then you can eat it. That's easy. Well, we went with our friends uh, Chris and Sally, but Chris doesn't do anything easy, so he didn't bring the little aluminum bags. He brought a little spread that he was going to cook while he was there. So he has his pan and a little bit of oil and he's cooking it up and then he's cooking some vegetables, sauteing some vegetables. Chris, what are you doing? Well, then pretty soon we're all overcome with fumes and we shoot out of the cave one at a time. We're like, Chris, what are you doing in there? He said, well, I brought some chorizo. And chorizo is a spicy little sausage that fills up all the air in the cave and burns your eyes out and chases you out. So we sent Chris back into the cave by himself to retrieve his stove and his torizo to get it out and he had to cook it outside. So once you settle down for the evening, um, you can lay down and there's all our four caves, you know, and so you have your cave set up and you sleep in there with your sleeping bag and your mat, you know. And the best part is you heat up your water bottle, you, you boil your water and pour it into a Nalgene water bottle because you can put that at the bottom of your sleeping bag and it keeps your feet warm. Huh? And it keeps the water from freezing so you can actually drink it. Because everything that is not in your bag or next to your body is frozen solid. So if you want water, you have to keep it close to you. So you have the water boiled and we're in there. The thing about sleeping at 12,000 feet in a snow cave is your body doesn't get the message, go to sleep your body gets the message, stay warm, stay warm, stay warm, stay warm, stay warm. And the re result of that is you have to go to the bathroom about every 90 minutes whether you want to or not. So you don't ever get good sleep. Now have you had nights when the morning just wouldn't come? Have you had nights where either for whatever reason you were too excited 
or you were too sad, or too lost, or you were sleeping in a snow cave at 12,000 feet, and you just couldn't go to sleep, and every time you get up, or every time you look at the clock, have you noticed the clock hasn't moved? Have you been in that night when the morning can't come soon enough? I will say the second night in the cave is much better. Your body is acclimated a little bit more. But there's something about, in the middle of the night, crawling out of a dark cave with a flashlight and kind of shoveling away the snow that's fallen overnight and emerging into darkness on a mountainside. I can tell you it's one of the most beautiful scenes you'll ever see, particularly after the clouds clear and the stars come out. With no lights anywhere near, the canopy of stars is unbelievable. And glistening on the snow, it's fairly magical. You don't spend a lot of time reflecting. You scurry back into the cave where it's warm. Warmer, I should specify. But there's something about when the sun comes up that even through the little air hole, you can see the light of the day. And what a beautiful sight that is when the morning finally comes. When you finally have a reason to be awake, when you finally have a reason to get out of bed, when you finally have made it through that evening. It's a beautiful sight to come out of. I believe sometimes our faith journey is like that night. I believe sometimes our faith journey, we feel surrounded by darkness and every time we look up, every time we go to church, or every time we read the Bible, or every time we say a prayer, it's like we glance at the spiritual clock and it's still not daylight yet. Have you had this experience where you're, you're trying to your best for the faith to grow and it seems like each time you look over to check your progress, the sun still hasn't risen? The miracle of this Easter story in Matthew tells us that even in the darkness, when it feels like your faith isn't going anywhere, the miracle of God, the resurrection of Christ, is taking place in your life right now. And the dawn of the new day allows us to see it and to experience it. The miracle of Easter is the work is going on right where you are, right now. And you don't have to wait till morning light for God to work in your life. When you're standing in the darkness, and you see a door close. And brothers and sisters, we see doors close in our lives all the time, do we not? Even doors we try to hold open. Even things we want differently, we see doors close. And often, the doors that close are beyond our power to reopen. The stone that was in the tomb, that sealed the tomb, was more than a couple of people, men, women, or anyone, could move out of the way easily. It took a lot of very strong people and probably some levers to get that tomb door shut or open. And when we see the darkness come, and a door close in our lives, whether it's a job, or a relationship, or the loss of a loved one, when we see that door closed, the darkness can be overwhelming, can it not? I'm also struck at looking at a sunset and watching the sun melt into the sky on the west. Watching the sun set in the west the only way you're going to see the dawn of a new day, the only way to see the sunrise, 
is to turn around. Because the sun has never come back up from the same place it set. The only way to see a new dawn is to turn around and look to the east. When a door closes in our lives and we feel like we're encaged in darkness, very often the new day is behind us. And another door, just as this one has closed, God is opening a new door, a new way. When they closed Jesus' body in that tomb, they said they'll never get out of there. God is unimpressed by doorways or windows. God's miracle works right there in the dark. And Jesus was resurrected right through the tomb. There's a word in in the Christian language that um, is usually translated repentance. The word in Greek is metanoia. Uh, Meta meaning change, and noia meaning the noose, yourself, to change yourself. Literally in Greek, it's also used to mean to turn around. If you think about repentance, not only stopping what we're doing, but to literally turn around to see what God might be doing in a place that we're not looking. Metanoia is familiar because it's the same Uh, concept that we use for metamorphosis, which is the caterpillar entering a cocoon and after a time rising as a butterfly. Meta meaning change, morphosis meaning physically. Metanoia is meta being change, and the noia is yourself, your inner self. That turning around is what allows us to see the dawn of a brand new day that God has made for us. And brothers and sisters, we've all been there, haven't we? Staring at the horizon, staring at the closed door, expecting it's going to open again. The miracle of Easter is that God has already worked the resurrection of Christ in our lives and has opened a new door, has dawned a new day, has given a new sunrise, And often we don't want it, because we want that. But that metanoia, that giving ourselves over, that turning around, and seeing the light that God has provided, to see the miracle that has already happened, and to see the dawn of a brand new day right there for us. That's the invitation of Easter. And it's the invitation that I give to you today. Today we have some stones here, small stones. The stones that block what I want tend to be very large, do they not? But if you picture the large stones that we cannot move, in God's hands they're very small. What I want to invite you today is to be in an attitude of prayer and to close your eyes for a moment, if you will. And to reflect on what door has closed, what light has gone out, what stone is in your way. And then in your mind's eye, I want you to turn around. Metanoia. Repentance. And see what God is doing where you have not yet looked. Brothers and sisters, I believe that God has opened a new way. The stone has been rolled away, and it is the dawn of a brand new day for all of us. Amen.